<laughs> Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, I feel like we should have our own sort of venting session for all that has happened in the past week between the Supreme Court and the hearings yesterday and all the things that are out there. But it is, I just think it's important to think about everything that has happened as layered on to life experience and stresses that people are already experiencing. You know, when gas is $5 a gallon, the grocery store is just crazy. And then you've got all of this going on. I mean, it's not surprising um, that there are just so many concerning issues, both around substance use and around mental health. So we begin, as we always do, by talking a little bit about where we've been in the last month. And one of the concerning pieces we have since our last meeting experienced 21 fatal overdoses across the county. Um, and, and obviously, one of those is too many. What is concerning is a return to some of the things that we had seen before. So for instance, in the last week in Somerville, we've had two, two separate double overdoses. Um, one person did not survive, the other three are hospitalized. It had been sort of a long time since we were seeing those double incidents. We've also started seeing what I really thought were gone, which were the outside overdoses. We just really hadn't been seeing those, you know, behind a building and that kind of public situation. We had would probably been two or three years since we've had one of those. Um, and those have come back. So that is not obviously a good trend. Um, and it's just something to be thinking about. That's 114 overdoses since January 1st. So even though we are sort of in the ballpark of the same number as the last couple of years, it is concerning the trends in also with that broader range of age is coming back as well. So it just reminds everybody, as you well know, that the work continues. Um, one update is, and this is good news, um, just last week, you probably saw the legislature added a large amendment to the behavioral health ABC 2.0 bill, um, primarily dealing with parity in mental health care. And the legislature does seem committed to finalizing that bill. Um, the Senate will have to take up the bill and get it passed by the end of July which given that you know, pretty much the end of this week will be gone and next week, there'll be lots of people on vacation is a pretty short window. Um, that comprehensive amendment does a few things, four things specifically. It addresses boarding, requiring a real-time bed search and other oversight with a specific focus on kids. As I've mentioned before, right now in our county, the average time for kids in an ER looking for mental health services is 79 days. That's a long time to be hanging out in the ER. The second thing it does, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a bit, is it establishes the 988 commission with language that gives the 988, that's the hotline um, authority to implement a three pillar plan for crisis response. It includes something well needed and something we're really going to be focusing on this year during the school year. It gives language that requires, provides language that requires schools to develop a mental health support in a crisis plan. And then finally, it establishes a structure for psychiatric collaborative care models, um, mental health care in your primary care physician's office. So when you think about what we've got, which is kids boarding in the ER, um, in the last few weeks of school, I don't think we had a day where we were not dealing with a kid mental health threat crisis in a town, um, sometimes three or four. I think the most was one day we had four going at once. And these were not just a kid in the cafeteria saying, you know, I'm gonna do something crazy. 
These were kids with some pretty defined threats, kill lists, and tragically, and really tragically, considering the gun decision, kids who we discovered had access to firearms. So they weren't just saying it. They potentially had the means to carry out what they were saying. So it certainly seemed a particularly bad time to start giving more people access to guns. Um, so that we look forward to hopefully getting through the Senate in the next four weeks and the governor signing it. Um, I particularly want to thank Laurie Krinsky, who I think is here, although I haven't seen her yet, um, who is from the local chapter of NAMI, who really keeps her finger on the pulse of these and I know is very involved in the launch today, the 15 minutes at noontime, which if people aren't aware of it, we can put the link in the chat for that at noontime. They're going to talk about the new 988 number and some information about that. And then as we're rounding out Pride Month, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about the implications for the LGBTQ plus community in the context of substance use disorder. And I wanna be very clear that that connection has nothing to do with people being a part of that community and it has everything to do with the stigma around mental health issues. Um, we know that people who are identifying as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, questioning, are facing all kinds of stigma, discrimination. Um, we've seen just in the last couple of days, a couple of really awful assaults where that kind of discrimination, those kind of hate remarks seem to be the basis of, for what happened. Um, and that threat of harassment and violence um, really puts sexual minorities at an increased risk for behavioral health issues. And remember that is outside coming to them. Um, and many of the federally funded surveys that are looking at these issues, and it's not long time research, it's only in the last five to eight years that people have started really collecting that information. But we do know that substance use disorder, particularly around young people in that community are higher. So that's a different piece. One study showed that almost 40% of people who identified as a sexual minority, so almost half, um, had used illicit drugs in the past. And that compares to 17% of the population that is not identifying as a sexual minority. So almost double that number. Um, and nearly 30% of those who are transgender or gender non-conforming report a past use of illicit drugs. And the other issue is, and this is a self-medication issue, you know, barriers to healthcare for members, particularly of the transgender population. And if you've been following the dots fallout, that is a real piece of that. Will states permit people to get the kind of healthcare they need, but if you can't get that healthcare, then you're gonna self-medicate. And then you're gonna be doing it with illegal or street drugs and then potentially charged with a criminal offense. Um, you know, if prescription hormone replacement therapy is not available as it will not be available in many of the 26 states that are gonna follow Dobbs. So if you can't get that, particularly if you've already sort of needed it and we're in that process, people are gonna to turn to street hormones. And then you have the possibility not only of being arrested for possession of those street drugs, but also possession of needles or other paraphernalia. And then if you layer on top of that, I mean, talk about intersectionality. If you layer on top of that, the, populate, the members of that community that are also people of color, who are already having a higher rate of interaction with the police. You can see how it's just sort of a spiral that people get in, get into. Um, and the other piece is, and this is particularly true for young people, almost half of the young people who identify as a sexual minority who are homeless say that they have engaged in things like, um, selling 
are trading sex for money or for drugs themselves. So, and then you layer into that other health issues. That just drives that piece up. And then you look at the question of if you are in a member of a sexual minority and you are looking for substance use disorder treatment, what kind of a program are you going to? And studies show that people in the sexual minority community tend to have a much worse substance use disorder. They tend to be much more advanced in their disorder before they seek treatment. And they are also much more likely to have comorbid or co-occurring mental health issues. What is a bright spot is that when they are able to get treatment in a place that is gender affirming or can address other issues, they do better on the treatment of their substance use disorder. So all kinds of issues and a piece about that. Um, and again, NAMI has got some terrific information and resources for identifying those risk factors. Um, and think about sort of the whole idea of even just coming out or identifying as in need of treatment, all of which was made, has been made worse by this court decision. And what that means in terms of stress, what it means about maybe being turned out by your family, um, being out on the street, not having a way to live, all of those pieces. You can see how that just takes us down a path that increases the risk for substance use disorder, increases the risk for an overdose, all of those pieces. So I think to that end, there are two speakers today and the information they're gonna provide is particularly relevant. Um, and I'm grateful to have them here with us. And we're gonna hear first from Jessica Vanderstead, um, who is the Massachusetts Area Director of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And I have to say that the Foundation for Suicide Prevention has been just an incredible resource for us around so many issues. Um, one of the things we probably won't talk a lot about today, but you know, we have so many instances where things happen and someone dies by suicide and there's real questions about how much information do you put out? You know, there's a balance between letting people know what's happening, taking away some of the stigma, then the worry about copycat instances and what is too much to put out. Um, and really they have been an incredible partner for us. And as part of their growing nationwide network of chapters, Jessica works to put, really bring people together from all of the silos in the community to address this issue. Um, whether it is family and friends who've lost someone to a death by suicide, people who are vulnerable themselves, mental health professionals, clergy, students, educators, community leaders, everybody can help to energize this discussion. And Jessica is going to share a lot of information today with us about um, the Talk Saves Lives program, mm -hmm. which gives participants a clear understanding of this leading cause of death, the most up-to-date research, what all of us can do. You know, one of the saddest things I think always when we have a death by suicide is the what ifs that we hear from people who were family or friends. I saw something, I thought something, I didn't do something. What if I could have done something else? And really apropos of the conversations we've been having about that, um, Jessica will tell us about the presentations that Talk Saves Lives has to be delivered in a workplace to organizational leaders, to supervisors, other employees. It gives you an idea of the scope of the problem, um, the warning signs, the risk factors, and some really common sense things that people can do. I don't think, I often think it's not that people don't want to do anything, they just they're paralyzed by it. They don't know what to do with it. And I think they obviously don't want to make things worse. So this program is just really so very helpful. And Jessica, I'm really happy to have you here this morning. So thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much. Um, you know, I do want to acknowledge, we were chatting about this before everyone joined the meeting. It's, it's, this topic itself and, and what you meet on on a you know, regular basis is heavy. And now we're talking about suicide prevention. And the truth is, it's, a heavy world right now. Um, I was sharing a little earlier that, you know, I was, I've just been in kind of negative mood this week and that's not like me. And I had to realize that, that everything that's going on in the world is, um, it, it impacts us in more ways we know. So I just encourage you that 
telling all kind of our, you know, um, professionals this week is practice what you, what we preach, you know, make sure you're taking time for self-care, make sure that you are reaching out if you are struggling and know that helps available. And I'll offer some resources in today's presentation, but if there's any specific questions, anything I can help, um, I'll stay for the duration of the presentation and I can always answer in the chat box. Um, so, but I'll get started. I'm excited to be able to share a little more about AFSP, the work we're doing, and really it goes perfectly what's going to be pre presented later with mental health um, first aid. So our fight to stop suicide. Today, we're going to talk a little, oh, come on. There we go. Today, we're going to talk a little bit um, about our organization, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, why we fight for to stop suicide, um, how we fight for it, and also what you can do um, at the local level. So a little bit about AFSP, we are a national organization. I oversee the Massachusetts chapter with the team of um, two amazing people um, with an open position, <laughs> if anybody's interested. Um, but our mission is to save lives and bring hope to those affected by suicide. We recognize that you know, deaths by su suicide deaths are a major component of the opioid crisis, and it's something that has to be addressed. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the research we're doing and other work we're doing around that. You know, one thing that I, um, and this is something you probably know, is that research is now showing that about 30% of opioid overdoses are, may actually be deaths by suicide. And there's a number of reasons why they're not reported as suicide, um, most often that it's not a clear indication that it was suicide. But we're seeing this percentage grow and it's very concerning. So our organization is a voluntary health organization. We are volunteer driven. We have volunteers across the nation. Um, and our focus is really saving lives and supporting those that are left behind after suicide or after attempt. And we do this through research, education, advocacy, and outreach and support services. We were founded in 1987, and we have um, chapters now in every state, including Alaska and Hawaii, and actually a brand new chapter in Puerto Rico, which we're very excited about. Um, so we're a growing organization. Um, when I started with doing this work in 2000. Nine, um, you know, we were a small little chapter and we've grown tremendously through the just work of passionate individuals at both the local and the national level. Some of our core values that keep us moving forward are passion, community, harmony, harmony impact, and well being. So, a little bit about what AFSP is today we are the national leading nonprofit organization dedicated to suicide prevention. We are evidence-based and evidence-informed driven by science. So all of our programs that either are our own created programs or programs that we endorse are evidence-based. And we engage people that have been personally affected, whether they have lost somebody, they've struggled, or they support someone who does, or they work in the mental health suicide prevention field. And I think the biggest thing that makes our organization stand out is our investment in research. And I'll go into depth some of the research studies that we currently have going on that may interest you, but we've vet, invested over $30 million per year in research, education, advocacy, and support. Now to clarify some things that we are not, so we are not a crisis center. However, we do partner with groups like the Samaritans, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline for those intervention services. We do not run our own support groups. However, we do provide training for individuals that want to start a support group. And um, we do not make grants to other organizations. So while we do have our research grants um, for research projects that are handled at the national level, we do not actually provide grants to organizations for um, support and programs. However, many of our programs are offered at no cost or um, we help organizations for, you know, get grants to support those programs. So just a little overlook of our prevention through partnerships. Um, you'll recognize some of these logos here, if not all of them. Um, just a couple to highlight, of course, OSHA, um, the National Shooting Sports Foundation, and SSF, which is one of our partners in our firearms and suicide prevention program, um, NAMI, which was mentioned, the Lifeline, Jed Foundation, the Trevor Project, some amazing organizations up here. And our work varies with them, whether it's partnership on programs or educational, you know, corporate education, employee education, 
but these are just uh, some of our, our partnerships. A little bit about charitable giving. Um, I encourage if you're interested in more about where we spend the funds, how we spend the funds, to take a look at Charity Navigator. Our real focus is to invest the funds that we raise back into the community. So we are um, very, I like to say, staff light, <laughs> volunteer heavy. Um, you know, I am a team of three in the state of Massachusetts. When I transferred out here from the West Coast, I was a single person and covered four chapters. Um, again, it's mostly just to keep those funds going back into the community. So why we fight for suicide? And I know this is probably an easy question to answer, but it's actually a little more depth than just to save lives. The truth is that right here, right now, it's the perfect time to really focus on mental health um, and suicide prevention. Now more than other, I think people are realizing that mental health can affect anyone at any time. We especially saw this during the pandemic when individuals started to struggle that may have never had a mental health condition or struggled with anxiety, stress, depression um, before. We also know that suicide prevention movement is gaining strength, um, you know, and more people are affected that are, more people who are affected are speaking out and getting involved. And part of this is breaking the stigma, though I will say we have a long ways to go to truly get at a point where those who struggle will actively seek help. And there's more collaboration on what we do. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about some of our collaborations that we have um, here in Massachusetts. And also the changing attitudes, right? We're talking about this more. Even the media is better reporting on this subject and helping to break down those barriers. So some facts, suicide is the leading cause of death in the US. Um, approximately 40,000 Americans die each year. Um, and we're just starting to get some preliminary numbers from 2020, 2021. CDC is always about two years behind in reporting. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for those ages 10 to 34, and we're actually seeing an, a huge increase in even younger than 10 years old, which is very concerning. And when we talk about, you know, the suicide deaths, we have to also talk about the suicide attempts. Right. And we know that more than 1 million suicide attempts happen every single year. And we know that individuals who don't receive treatment um, after their attempt are more likely to attempt again. So in Massachusetts, um, suicide is the 13th leading cause of death, and it's actually the second leading cause of death for ages 15 to 34. And what's interesting is that more than four times as many people die by suicide than homicide. However, I think the attention on suicide is much less than crime and, and homicide. I'll give you a check a second to review right. this. All right. of, oh. Is that somebody popping in? Hello? Marion, you're not on I mute. Know that, like, oh. <laughs> I thought someone was trying to get my attention. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'll give you a chance to review this. All of these fact sheets, both on the, the national and local level, are available on our website, and I can post the yeah, links exactly, at the end of yeah, today's yes. presentation. So what's interesting too is that according to a recent Harris poll is that most Americans believe that mental health is equally important as physical health. Now this is something we've been promoting for a long time, right? The need to treat mental health just as we do physical health. Health, health. I often tell people that you know just as you have a physical every year or, or should have it every year, <laughs> every couple of years maybe, um, also have that check up from the neck up, check in with your brain, check in with how you're feeling and seek help if you are struggling. And our big focus is that really bringing people together of all backgrounds, all different walks of life so that we can be united to encourage those who struggle to seek help, improve the quality of their lives and ultimately stop the tragic loss of life. So how we fight for the cause. As I mentioned, AFSP is really focused on scientific research, education, advocacy, outreach, and support. So a little bit about the funding of the research. Um, AFSP is the largest private funder of suicide prevention research. Um, the current total estimate, uh, investment, sorry, is 23.7 million 
um, which is huge. And it ranges from both amateur studies to professional studies. Um, you know, Massachusetts is really fortunate that we work a lot with Harvard University. And one of our um, first million dollar grantees was actually Dr. Matthew Nock, um, who's a professor at Harvard, who's studying how to use technology as an intervention method for suicidal um, actions and, and ideation. His study is fantastic. Um, we have one of his presentations recorded on our YouTube page. Um, but it's really that these research studies are changing how we develop programs, how we develop intervention methods, and how we implement them in communities and individuals. A couple that I did want to um, highlight um, is really the studies that we currently have um, regarding opiate. So some of the studies that we currently have um, are a study on opiate suicide in patients with major depression. There's another funded story that our uh, research study that is following um, people with chronic pain and the association with suicidal behavior. And then a further study, um, which is really fantastic, is the evaluation of suicide risk, opiate and sc pain screening in primary care. Um, now, all of these are still ongoing at this point. Um, most all of them were multi-year um, grants, but they can find preliminary information on our website. It's just afsp.org slash research. And regularly, we do have presenters or researchers present on their fan findings in the community. Um, and oftentimes, these are virtual and, and recorded. So they're available on our website as well. I did want to share a brief clip uh, from one of our researchers that I was focusing on this area. I'm really interested in overdose prevention. Um, there's been a ton of federal resources, federal attention on what's called the opiate crisis. Uh, but actually, overdose and suicide are quite related. I mean, a most practical way being that oftentimes if someone has passed away from an overdose, it's really difficult for the medical examiner, for the family, to know whether or not that that overdose was uh, someone attempting to have to die by suicide or whether it was fully unintentional. And I would um, guess from in a lot of cases, it's somewhere in between. It's not clear. So I think the efforts that have been happening to try and address the opiate crisis will have some benefits for reducing suicide potentially to population level, but haven't really been designed with that purpose. And I think given how important suicide is in the US, it's nearly as common as overdose. Oops. Um, designing our programs and our interventions to address both at the same time is really important. So more than anything, research is really helping us to understand the link between suicide and opiate. And it's really shedding use on the misuse of prescription drugs, which I know was spoken about earlier today. Um, also, the relationship between substance use disorder and psychiatric disorders, which we are finding are often coexisting. And also the relationship with pain, um, especially when it is a chronic condition. So, um, Talk Saves Lives was mentioned earlier, um, and I'm really ex excited that Mental Health First Aid is following up um, right after this presentation. So AFSP focuses on a number of educational programs. Um, Talk Saves Lives is probably one of our most widely used. It is a 45 minute to 60, 45 to 60 minute presentation that I often share is the like the CPR of suicide prevention. It is something that anyone can be trained on. It talks about how to recognize the warning signs, what to do if you or someone you know is in crisis and how to connect somebody with help. Um, so it's not designed to make you a, you know, a suicide prevention interventionist um, in an hour that of course takes many more trainings and hours than that. But it's really just a basic suicide prevention 101 that can be used in any demographic. Um, we do encourage at least 15 years of age or older and typically our participant size is about 30 to 50 is an ideal number um, just for safety and you know, providing participants a comfortable environment to share. Um, it's also available virtually, which is very important. And we have a number of different types or different modules that we add, that can add on, including seniors and suicide, um, the LGBTQIA plus community, um, military, 
and also a brand new program for corrections officers. Um, and we are currently piloting a program um, for inmates um, in correctional institutions. So that available that program is available at no cost. And as I mentioned, we can either do an in-person or virtually. There's also another a number of other programs for different demographics, such as our It's Real College Students in Mental Health, which can be used both at the college level as well as the junior senior level of high school for individuals that are going into college um, soon. We also have our More Than Sad program, which focuses on um, middle age to high school level. And we have a brand new program called, or I shouldn't say it's brand new, a brand new partnership um, program that's called Gizmo, which is focused on even younger than middle school that really uses this adorable little dog um, named Gizmo to help children talk about you know, feelings and emotion and recognize um, when, when they need to ask a trusted adult for help. Now, all of these programs, I often, you know, there's a huge menu book that we can provide. It's a little overwhelming, but I encourage organizations to think about what are you trying to achieve by a training? Are you just trying to educate your staff on awareness? Are you looking for more, more in depth? We may have staff that are dealing with patients or clients, um, or are you looking forward to really build an intervention program for your organization or your, or your business? Um, and from there, we can help to determine what is best. Um, an example of this is oftentimes when we go work with the local school is that we'll do a, we'll do assist, which is a two day, 16 hour program for the counselors, for the, um, you know, the, if there's a psychologist on staff, for more of those people that are going to be involved in the intervention methods. And then from there, we may do a talk saves lives for the parents and the community. And then we may train the teachers to do the more than sad program in their classrooms. So it's multi-level, but it kind of fits every demographic that we're working with. We also provide um, suicide prevention education materials at no cost. This is just kind of a brief overview um, of some of our brochures. Again, we can just ship these to you so you can have them in your you know, waiting room or in your office. Um, so these are just some great ones. Lifesaver's Guide is a great little booklet, fits right in your wallet that gives the warning signs and, and resources. And the same with the LGBT Suicide Prevention Guide, just specific to the LGBTQIA community. You know, it was mentioned earlier about the lost survivors, those that are left behind. Um, we do have two really great programs for lost survivors specifically. The first is International Survivors of Suicide Loss Day. This is always held the Saturday before Thanksgiving. Um, the last couple of years we have been virtual, hoping to be back in person this year, but still with a virtual component. But this is just a day of healing for those that are left behind after suicide loss. It is a one day event that is held um, around the world and it connects survivors for hope, for understanding and for an opportunity to share. Many people who attend this program are newly bereaved. Um, even we've had individuals days, weeks out from their loss. And it's kind of that warm welcome into the world of healing and grief and recovery. And the Healing Conversations program is a great complement to that. Um, Cause as I mentioned, Survivor's Day is only held once a year. Saturday, Saturday before American Thanksgiving. Healing Conversations is a program that's available anytime by request of someone that's left behind after suicide death. So by request, we pair them up with another survivor who is trained and further out in their loss for just some general guidance, peer-to-peer -peer support. Typically, this is only a one or two you know, time meeting with the survivor um, and the trained volunteer. And from there, they're introduced to other resources in their communities. Advocacy and pu public policy is a big initiative of our organization and something I absolutely encourage you to get involved in. We um, do two events every year. We do a um, national advocacy forum that's held every June. Um, fortunately, this year we went virtual again, but hopefully in 2023, we're back in person. And then we also have a state capital day. And here in Massachusetts, we partner with the um, one of the coalitions to host this day. Again, hoping to be back in person in 2023. But um, the pandemic has really taught us that there's a lot that we can still do even in the virtual world, including, um, I think we've actually been a little more successful in securing meetings over the last few months um, because we're able to do them over Zoom. And just really putting, we have to explain to our volunteers, it's, it's putting that face to our cause. 
you know, as a constituent, when you walk into your representative's office um, and share your story, like they want to listen. You live in their community. They serve your community. So and in, in asking, you know, what they can do to help further the cause, whether it's supporting 988, which has been a big initiative over the last few years, or even one of my first years involved in this organization, we were on on Capitol Hill um, and we were working to overturn a policy that was in place. And this policy was that when anybody in the military died by suicide, they did not receive a condolence letter from the president. When they died by any other means, they received a condolence letter. Um, it seems so, I mean, I mean, common sense, like why would this not take place? But it took advocates, our organization and a few other partners to overturn this. And um, that was probably in 2010, I believe. <laughs> Years blurred together after a while, um, but we were able to overturn that. And now any, any individual who has served that dies by suicide, their family receives a condolence letter. Another great way to get involved um, is something you may have heard of our Out of the Darkness Community Walks. Uh, we have kind of three different levels of this. We do our overnight walk, which is held once a year um, in different parts of the country. This year it was held in New York just a few weeks ago. That's a 16 to 18 mile walk overnight from sundown to sunrise to raise awareness and to raise funds for our organization. We also in the state of Massachusetts hold both our community walks and our campus walks. Our campus walks are always held in the spring and they're student driven. So whether it's high school or college level, they create these events on their campus to raise awareness and to raise funds and resources. And then our community walks, which we this fall will have eight across the nation from Springfield to the Cape to the Worcester in partnership with um, the, the Woo Sox. But they're great events that you can come out to. There's no cost to register. And it's a chance for not only individuals, families, but also organizations to get involved. We often have a resource fair at our walks, um, so something to think about. But um, again, it's just about creating awareness and raising funds. And those community walks, we kick off this year in Massachusetts, September 17th in Worcester, and then we end in Springfield and Boston on the same day, October 22nd. So to talk a little bit about our communications, um, there's a number of campaigns that we have going on to raise awareness. These are just some of our national partnerships, um, you know, Netflix, ABC. Um, I personally was able to work on a project with ABC for A Million Little Things, the TV show. Amazing cast, amazing creator um, who really used that, you know, that show um, as an opportunity to raise awareness of mental health and suicide. One um, campaign that I do want to highlight and I encourage you to check out is our Seize the Awkward campaign. This was a public service campaign that was um, developed in partnership with the Dead Jed Foundation and the Ad Council. It's really focused on teens and young adults, and it's super catchy, super graphic, um, and it involves a lot of social influencers and musicians and artists, um, actors, actresses to to seize the awkward, to have that awkward conversation about mental health. The um, PSAs that are available are, are quite entertaining, and you may have even seen some. I know one played during the Super Bowl, which was a huge, huge accomplishment for us. Um, but again, it's just about breaking that stigma and encouraging people to have a conversation if they're struggling themselves or they're worried about somebody. And it really um, helps, to, helps to normalize it more than anything, normalize mental health. So to finish out today, I'll talk a little bit about our local level and how obviously you, you can get involved. We're always looking for more volunteers. It was mentioned earlier, never have enough people to do what we want to do. Um, so again, we're in all 50 states um, in Washington, DC, Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico now. All of our chapters are driven by a local board of directors who every year organize a, or sorry, create and um, prepare a budget and business plan. Um, which then our volunteer committees implement in the community. Our focus is to create a culture that's smart about mental health through the things that I mentioned, supporting scientific research, education, advocacy, outreach, and support. Um, we have a place for everyone, whether you're a mental health professional, you're a community advocate, you're a survivor, or you have struggled with suicidal ideation. Our organization really wants to empower you to have a voice in the prevention movement. So now that you're feeling inspired and ready to get involved, 
Um, I encourage you to register for a local walk coming up. As I mentioned, our season kicks off on September 17th, but now is a perfect time to get registered, form your team. You can sign up to be a field advocate, which is our, again, our advocacy program, both at the local and the national, or the local and the national level. And that's a great program because it's really, um, the time commitment varies according to how much you got, get involved. At the very least, you can sign up to be a field advocate and receive email notifications when there's certain actions that we need to take to whether it's to secure, secure funding or um, to oppose something that is being you know, passed. Give a gift if you're looking to give a donation. Um, partner to bring prevention to whether it's your school, organization. Um, you know, the, the talk saves lives and mentioned multi different modules. Um, and I think I don't think I mentioned the corporate one as well. So there is a workplace one that's specific for workplaces, which has been really extremely successful here in Massachusetts. Um, and a lot of corporations that may have never talked about mental health before are bringing this program in to really support their staff and their employees and kind of build up their EAP programs. Always sponsor an event or get involved as a resource fair participant. And finally, get trained, whether it's Talk Saves Lives, Mental Health for Save, Safe Talk, or Assist. Connect with us. Um, we'll work to find the best program that works for you or for your individual, or for your organization. So thank you again for um, learning more about AFSP and for having me here today. I'd be happy to answer questions. I think we have plenty of time to do that. Um, but thank you again just for being part of the movement to save lives. And of course, if you're on social media, you can um, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. Um, we're not quite on TikTok yet, but I'm sure that's only a matter of time um, before we do that. AFSP National is our national organization to follow the Massachusetts chapter. It's just AFSP Massachusetts. Jessica, thank you. Question. Thank you. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna find my mouse and, and stop my screen share. <laughs> Questions, comments? Get myself back here. All right, there we go. People have questions, comments? <laughs> there we go, all right. I am gonna drop our chapter website into the chat box. Um, everything I mentioned there can be found through links. Um, through our chapter website. Just, I just had one thing I wanted to mention. We we actually had a um, a suicide of an elder um, this past week. Seventy eight year old woman died. Um, it was medical. Um, talk a little bit about um, elder suicide, death by suicide among our elders. Yeah, you know it's it's one of those groups that is I feel like. Um, not talked about often, but we are seeing increase. Um, and it's the many of the factors that we that we talk about when risk factors, you know, the isolation, um, the change in, you know, life um, often, you know, um, added with, you know, maybe, um, you know, possible terminal illness, um, things like that. Um, there's a really high need and we're working on getting our kind of foot in the door in regards to um, assisted living homes. Because often that transition, you know, from living on their own to transition to, you know, assisted living can be quite difficult. You know, their 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 life is changed. Um, just as we talk about, you know, when there's like a loss of a partner, their life changes. Um, so many of the, you know, any of the tro programs can really be focused on training those individuals. But with our Talk Saves Live, we have a special module that kind of dives deeper into the risk factors that may be associated with elders. And. You know, just one of the things that's come up for us a number of times, and it kind of goes back to that same gun issue, is very often people move into one of those assisted living facilities, especially the ones that have radiations of care, when they are very well, they're just kind of downsizing and they move into essentially the apartment piece of that. And there is no prohibition about them bringing guns with them if they own a gun. And as that care may deteriorate, I mean, as their need for care may grow, excuse me, as their condition may deteriorate, no one steps in to find out if they have a gun or they brought the gun into that facility. So we've unfortunately had several deaths by suicide by gun 
in those facilities where the person owned the gun, legally had the gun, but had clearly reached a point where they shouldn't have access to that gun anymore. And, you know, it's just not something that people think about. And so one of the things we've been saying a lot is if you have a relative or a family member that you put in one of those facilities, you want to be thinking about that because somebody can perfectly legally move from their own house, have a permit, bring that gun. And, you know, maybe they end up in the memory care part of the place or they end up somewhere else. No one has ever. Ever, you know, that's their private home. So just like your home, nobody's ever come and done a sweep of that house to see if they have a gun with them. And they differ in that way from a nursing home kind of thing where they tend to be clearer about what you can move in with you. That's really interesting information. I, I didn't personally know that. Um, you know, and I, I think I said this before the rest of the group got on, but um, we have a suicide, we have a firearms and suicide prevention program. And our focus is educating. Um, our CEO, so CEO said it years ago when he launched the program is that we're not in the business, as a suicide prevention organization, we're not in the business of saying who can and can't, who can and cannot own guns. We're in the prevention of saving lives. So teaching people how to keep safe, um, when to remove a firearm from the home, even simple things like you can go down the local lawn, you know, your local police station and get a free gun lock. Um, I mean, that's a basic way. Of course, we would love people to have safes and, you know, <laughs> a little higher, higher up, but at the very least, make sure that every firearm in your home is secured with a gun lock. Anybody else? Questions, thoughts? All right. And Jessica, Thomas, thank you, you hear my so dog much. snoring in the background. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank that was you. great information. All right. Um, Moving on to our second speaker, Jamie Ladera has spoke to us, many of us a couple of years ago about the principles of cultural humility. Um, she is a member of the Community Health Improvement Department at Cambridge Health Alliance, where she leads the youth programming with attention to substance use prevention and youth leadership and advocacy. She oversees their mental health awareness training and her experience includes both working in community-based settings, including urban schools, nonprofits, healthcare environments. She is an online instructor for BU's School of Social Work and holds a master's of social work and a master of public health from BU. And in her free time, which I don't know where we find that, but in her free time, she volunteers with the Girls Rock campaign in Boston, um, really merging that passion for kids development, specifically young women and love of rock and roll. And Jamie's going to talk to us um, a little bit about mental health first aid, a training program that many of us have heard about before. Um, and I think it's always good to just have a refresh and be thinking about that, particularly as we're facing so many new issues. So Jamie, thanks for coming back. Thank you so much. And we dug up an old bio. I still do um, the rock and roll work uh, with, with GRCB. Um, so it's a nice reminder that, that once I shared that information. So thank you so much for um, the invitation to be here today um, and talk about mental health first aid and um, following also after the um, AFSP discussion, uh, mental health first aid as another option to of what you can do in your communities with your organizations uh, to really uh, continue to increase our awareness and understanding of how we can support others uh, in, in our organizations for maybe our professional work, but really in our personal lives as well. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about our program at CHA specifically, and then uh, really share more about how you can also uh, bring this to your communities. Um, so let me just pull up everything here. Um, so there we go. Um, so let's see, it's been a little bit since I've done this. All right, so first, what is mental health first aid? I know that there's definitely some folks who have taken the training uh, and, and are familiar with it, but it starts really with this basis of mental health first aid is the help offered to a person developing a mental health or substance use challenge or experiencing a mental health crisis. And the first aid is given until appropriate treatment or support are received or until the crisis resolves. So it really is this early, it, 
option for early intervention, also how do you respond in a crisis, um, and there could be many different types of mental health crises, including uh, suicide ideation, um, and, and, and so we all have a role that we can play in, in prevention, and, and so this is really where it, it brings people together to learn. Uh, many of us don't learn about mental health um, in, in our upbringing, but we all come into contact with someone at any point in our lives, um, and we're not sure what to do, what to say, um, and if we can do anything. Uh, so it was founded in Australia, and it's been adapted to the United States, hence the, the mascot of the koala there. Uh, and it's actually been adapted internationally in many different countries. Uh, and so there is, so it's rooted in evidence and research, uh, that you know, so some of the content will be similar to maybe other workshops and trainings you've been to if you're familiar with QPR, Assist, um, Talk Saves Lives that was mentioned. Uh, a lot of it um, continues to build knowledge. So just because you've taken one, I say take another because you continue to to increase the language uh, of it. And so. It is an extensive training, so it is a it is typically an eight hour training. It's a certification, and it covers risk factors, warning signs, uh, you know, some language and information on common mental health conditions. And the real real focus of the training is that five step action plan to help someone. Um, and then also, we always provide a really extensive resource guide that's localized and designed specifically for the first aiders that are in our training. So it's not just kind of this random list, but really kind of goes through uh, the, the, the focus of the training so people understand what are the appropriate resources that we want to refer people to and connect people to at these different moments uh, when we're concerned about someone. And so similar to CPR and first aid, you know, it really gives us some real key tools that we can use to, to be able to intervene um, hopefully earlier, but also in these moments of crises as well. And it's not to supersede any sort of uh, role that you might have in, in your organization. So if you're working in a school, a hospital, um, it's really just to add to the toolbox. Um, and so, um, so, so similarly, we don't learn how to diagnose or any of that, but really, um, and, it's, and we take away kind of the trying to decide, is this anxiety, is this depression so much as, you know, my spidey senses are telling me something's going on for this person. How can I help them? What can I do to support them? Um, and then, oh, the other piece is that uh, in, in updates to the curriculum, they really shifted to make sure that also first aiders understand the role of self-care uh, and how to uh, enhance that, especially in these moments when you're helping other people so that you can also take care of yourself and, and what that means in, in a really practical sense, um, I should say, in terms of how, how do you debrief, how do you manage um, what you've experienced um, and what's been shared with you. Uh, so this is the five-step action plan. It's called ALGE. Uh, and so, and that is the name of the uh, koala, the mascot of mental health first aid. So like to always, uh, include the image of, of algae uh, as, as kind of a memory of, of, of the action plan. So it teaches right away around assessing for risk of suicide or harm, how we listen non-judgmentally, uh, and then how do you give reassurance and information? And then the next step being encouraging appropriate professional help and then encouraging self-help and other support strategies. And so throughout the training, it really digs into each of these steps all the way through what they mean. Um, ideally, everyone walks away with this memorized and that is a little bit part of the test uh, for it and understanding that uh, you know it's not linear and that we're doing these steps throughout. We're constantly assessing. And when we're supporting people, it doesn't mean that there is a you know, specific time frame that it's supposed to be conducted in, but uh, that we can we can do these things. These are not uh, necessarily difficult steps uh, to do, but kind of how can we make sure that we're giving reassurance and information, not just giving advice, or how are we listening without judgment to difficult uh, moments in people's lives? And then, of course, what are different resources? How do we really encourage people to, to connect with someone else, especially knowing that you are not the only person that can support someone, and that there are professionals that can support them? What are those emergency resources? What are those local resources? Are there any within your organization? Uh, you know, thinking about professional um, uh, assistance programs that maybe exist within different employment and stuff. So at Cambridge Health Alliance, we uh, have 
been we're funded right now through a SAMHSA grant that's five years. It's a mental health awareness training grant. It's our second grant. So uh, we, I have been a trainer since 2014, uh, and we been able to really uh, support the training in the past uh, four years uh, with SAMHSA funding to really expand what we were, we were able to do and who we're able to reach uh, because the requests have always been very consistent uh, for, for mental health first aid, but we haven't always been able to meet those requests. So we are expanding that and trying to also build sustainability within our communities. And uh, I should say just for, for understanding and how do we get to mental health first aid within Cambridge Health Alliance, we used to be a, um, a DC, we used to support a DFC uh, coalition in Everett. Um, that's what where kind of this work started. We continue to do substance use prevention uh, with the community of Everett. Uh, and, and, you know, it was the community coming to us really asking for more information uh, and, and understanding on mental health um, and what can we do? How can we support our family members, uh, the people in our community? And so that's, this is where um, we were able to bring some education information. And so we have built now a team of instructors. We work with partner organizations such as North Suffolk Mental Health, Elliot, um, other folks that we know throughout the years in different communities or organizations that are also instructors. And so we have really a mix of instructor experience and knowledge, which really I think helps elevate the conversation. We have people who have been, you know, trained as practitioners as well as people who are working in the community and, and able to really make those bridges and we're really, uh, focused on creating a diverse representation in our instructor team uh, as we start to think about what is mental health in these different uh, cultures um, and communities, ages, and all of these different experiences um, really helps uh, bring, bring this to life in different ways. We are currently implementing uh, the curriculums for adult and for youth, and that is for adults who work with youth. So how do you work with youth when you are concerned about their mental health and, and well-being? There's also curriculums uh, specific for public safety. And, and then we are beginning to uh, bring the teen curriculum to, to our region. And teen is for actual high school age groups. And I'll talk a little bit more about these curriculums in a moment. And we train. Um, any CHA staff that wants to come to the training, residents of these communities and organizations. Um, and we're particularly funded for the, these eight communities and we do work with our partners, uh, you know, uh, Sometimes there's ways around it uh, beyond these communities and whatnot because the requests in our organizations and our structures are, are, are varied. Uh, but, but we're really uh, focusing on enhancing the suicide prevention, mental health awareness um, within our service area as an organization. We do all of the training for free. Um, I believe strongly that this should be information that should be accessible for free. And so that is why we work really hard to make it, uh, get the funding to support it for our communities. And then with that, we do evaluation of of the training, we do uh, three years of follow up with the training participants, and uh, some of it's required uh, pieces with our funding. But we're also really just interested in what does this look like within our communities after so many people have been trained? How does this change how we approach things um, within our individual experiences, also within kind of our organizations and our communities, and what's happening as a result, um, kind of that ripple effect and impact. Uh, so we do um, have some information on how many people have been referred or encouraged to, to seek additional help. And also we're interested, how is this changing the knowledge um, and attitudes and beliefs? Uh, so just a little snapshot, and this is growing because we are currently running a training right now with uh, staff from uh, Somerville Public Schools that are involved in summer school programming. And so we're gonna hit the 1600 mark um, in just a moment, I think. Um, but since 2019, and we have trained a lot of people. We, you know, shifted virtually uh, to new curriculum and, and implementation in 2020. Uh, and now we're doing uh, a little bit of both in person and online. And um, I can also talk a little bit about what that looks like in just a moment. Uh, but in our follow up, which is people opt in, so we don't necessarily get all 1,500 people responding to our surveys, but it's a very overwhelming response of people that uh, say they have learned how to recognize signs and symptoms um, and really uh, at, at an increased level and that they feel confident in reaching out to, to someone. Um, you know, we also ask, you know, who have you encouraged appropriate 
um, re referrals for su professional support to. And we really didn't anticipate a, a huge response with our surveys, um, but we're finding that people are really utilizing the skills. Um, and, it, and we thought maybe one-to-one, -one, but maybe, but we're hearing that people are really um, using the skills in ways that they didn't anticipate. And one of that is that people are coming to our trainings maybe because they're required to by work. And then they find that they're helping a neighbor, a friend, a colleague, a member of their family uh, and, and didn't anticipate that impact. And we're seeing actually people respond to our surveys. Hey, sorry, Barbara. Um, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna Zoom a meeting, but um, Patty's here because some guy came to the door and he needs Lifeline. The hospital sent him here. Oh my god. So how do they get I mean not first not to bring his mother here but like to get lifeline so who I know Eileen does it who was big thank you. Um and so uh People are people are um, really finding that they're utilizing this in their personal life, sharing these stories with us, um, and it's really powerful. Um, and I'll and and so I have a few quotes about that experience as well. Um, and and so again, it's like, what are the re they learn? What are the resources? Who can they support people with? Uh, and 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 it's it's been an impressive response um, that people finally feel that maybe they have an are equipped with some skills that they didn't anticipate um, being a result of being in this training. And again, I mentioned that multilingual uh, localized resource guide that we provide with, um, with every training. And so some quotes from our training participants, the training has had a big impact on my ability to identify, advocate for and support others while being empathetic to their experiences and needs. And um, another, nurse said, I'm a registered nurse. This training gave me more resources and confidence to advocate, refer a patient to mental health when needed. I must say that so far this training has been a great asset, especially during this pandemic. And this was um, a nurse who was working in the ER. Uh, and so looking at, you know, and hearing their patients in different ways than maybe they had before and knowing that they can also make these, these referrals. So these are, of course, people in um, some clinical roles, but we hear this throughout, um, regardless of what role they have, uh, that they're, they're feeling more equipped with a skill um, and, and the confidence to, to help someone. And so kind of where does mental health fit, first aid fit into the spectrum, right, of, of how, um, how do we talk about mental health and where is it? And so it really, from our perspective, it's a prevention training that we put out there and make accessible in the community and uh, and that people are learning the skills of where to intervene on the earlier side because we're all on that spectrum of being well and unwell and we include recovery in the conversation about uh, mental health and well-being and so the the goal is to be in the earlier side of intervention but knowing that we also have some skills and resources uh, for for these crises as well. And so uh, I wanted to just speak kind of about kind of what is it and how, you know, you can also bring it into your organizations, to your communities, uh, much like we have done. Uh, you know, there's an increase, I, I am finding, and I don't know if others are, that there is an increasing amount of attention um, of funding towards the, the areas of mental health. And that, uh, you know, obviously with the current conditions that we, um, that we're experiencing and we've been talking about, right? People um, are needing additional support and resources. And we're finding, of course, though, that um, the systems are overwhelmed with, with being able to, to meet the demand. Um, and so Mental Health First Aid does not solve all of these systems issues, but it does increase the number of people who can be available in non-clinical ways. And sometimes that is what people really need um, or how to identify other resources that exist uh, that can support support someone's self-care and self-help strategies um, and, you know, when they maybe need a tune-up um, on some of, some of their coping and mechanisms. So it kind of fulfills that full spectrum of understanding what is mental health care and treatment and support. Uh, and so managed by the National Council for Mental Wellbeing, uh, they do a lot of other 
great work as well. And, uh, and it really is designed for members of the community. And so uh, I do get people in our training sometimes that have been um, told that they should be there and they have, you know, master's level clinical um, training and experiences. And so really think, um, encourage people to be thoughtful about, you know, who are the frontline staff um, working at, you know, the welcome desks or um, teachers in classrooms, um, people who are working in your cities, maybe that are in charge of parking and transportation uh, people who are coming into contact with people every day that maybe don't typically get this kind of training in their work. Um, uh, libraries are, are a really great source of and really growing, uh, increasing the training in, among all of their staff across the state. Uh, so there is a lot of adoption of this uh, and, and really um, faith communities. We've done trainings in churches and temples and uh, mosques over the years. So uh, everybody uh, you know, can benefit from something. Um, in, in, in this training. So this website is just more about our program at, um, at CHA. And then you can also go to um, mhfa.org to see a lot of this additional information as well as kind of how do you get trained um, and some stuff that I'm going to talk about now that I'm just highlighting um, based on my years of working with uh, the National Council. Uh, so there's lots of different curriculums. The real based on though that skill set um, that I talked about with the action plan, uh, adult and youth mental health first aid are really the main curriculums and then um, public safety, specialized modules around veterans, um, elders, uh, higher ed, fire and EMS are, are built in to be a little bit more specialized to those particular fields uh, of practice. Um, and, and again, um, you know, public safety and law enforcement, I've uh, done lots of trainings with them. And it, similarly, you know, they come back and say, you know, it's really helped me deal with some issues in my family. Um, and I thought, or how, how could I talk to my partner in a different way? Um, and, and it's amazing when you can have those honest conversations in, in, in communities and organizations that maybe there's a lot of stigma or challenges talking about these, these, uh, these topics. Um, so we are seeing that change, right? A little bit change on the um, movement on the barometer. Uh, it is available in Spanish, and we're going to begin training in Spanish uh, later this year, uh, and, and it's for the adult curriculums and the youth curriculums. And I have heard that they're looking to expand the other languages available so people can learn the curriculum, learn this information in native languages. Uh, then there is an increase um, uh, now of the teen mental health first aid curriculum. Uh, I'll speak more to that because it's a little bit different um, in terms of its structure and implementation, uh, but that finally they have really least a curriculum specific for teens. Um, and again, there are lots of great uh, training op options for young people in schools and other curriculums that are that um, exist. And this one follows again that that skill based learning uh, as well. Uh, so very basic, you know, it is a long day, it's a long training, um, but it's a certification. Uh, and so similar that, you know, we take first aid and CPR, it's really rooted in that kind of model. And then with the pandemic, we have learned, you know, different ways of implementing. And so we, we like to implement a, what's called the blended model, where people do two hours self-paced on their own and then attend a live class. And that live class can either be virtually live or it can be in-person live, um, obviously depending on comforts and safety and needs. Uh, and it's the same, you know, blended, virtual blended in-person, same curriculum. Uh, and the eight hour curriculum is actually all of the same as well. So if, you know, capacity, access to, you know, being able to do that, the online work, all of those different things uh, are considerations. So there's lots of new options for, for doing it. And the maximum number of people for is a, is a classroom of 30. I think the sweet spot is between 20 and 25 people with two instructors in, in the course. And so some costs about it, we do this for free. I hustle to get the money because I really believe strongly in, in it being accessible. But I, I, like I said, there's lots of funding coming out. Um, you know, one of our state grants just doubled for next fiscal year. What are we gonna do with that funding? You know, what can you do? Here's one option um, is it, rather than just spend money to get the trading come to you, uh, which we do sometimes as well, is thinking, how do we sustain this in our community? And, and that's what we've been doing over the the years within the CHA region. 
And so it's not free, it's a pretty extensive training for instructors and it's three or more days online taught by incredible um, national instructor team. And then you can get those other additional modules online. Um, and at least you don't have to pay the money for travel fees anymore, which um, eats up a lot of the budget. Um, and then if you really have extensive funding or a lot of people or a lot of goals of how to implement it, they can bring it to you. So. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there where those costs are. Uh, and then to maintain a certification training, uh, you have to do three within the anniversary of your, your instructor certification. And so that's three a year, 90 people could get trained, um, which is pretty amazing start to, to launching some, some real impactful um, community change around uh, mental health and suicide prevention. And so, uh, just kind of like, what does it cost to do a training? What's the value of a training? They like to say it's a, um, a value of $170 per person. And um, what that kind of breaks up into is what does it cost to pay a couple of instructors to do all of this work? Um, all day training, some of the back end and post training related pieces. There are manuals that everyone receives. Uh, to attend the training. There's also some online costs. Um, you don't have to do both. And I can, you know, talk more extensively for real in, in interests um, if people are trying to make a budget for it. Uh, but the online training, just because it's online, is, isn't any less expensive. People have access to a full amount of other, other resources and stuff. And of course, then um, supplies and food. To, to think about what is a cost to host a training. Uh, this newer curriculum that has just been put out, it's for the 10th to 12th grade age group or, um, or 15 to 18 years old. Uh, but really in order to do the teen training, you've got to train adults first um, because the training is teaching young people to talk to adults um, you know, in these moments of need and crisis, who do I turn to and who can young people trust uh, to talk to about it? So, um, so we're focusing on getting the youth training out there, working with some key school partners and then uh, beginning to get the, the teen curriculum in as well. It's a lot to implement that though. Uh, so really, um, Everyone has a best interest and, and goal of doing that, but really how, how do you get another um, thing into the school curriculum, into the school, school calendar year uh, when there is so much else? Um, and I think everyone agrees it's important, um, but that's really where you know, I recommend having really um, you know, strong advocates, adopters of this, real um, people who are an ambassador to, uh, to get this uh, to all of the people uh, within the community. Um, and so lots of different costs associated with it. So I didn't lay that out. But um, again, you know, if you have funding that you're looking for um, or figuring out how to use, uh, this is another great um, way of, of, of moving towards that. And so, you know, our final um, quote that I have here is it's freeing to know that if someone comes to you, there is a plan and resources so you're not feeling helpless when people come to you. Uh, and that really is a summary that we hear consistently from people is that I have a little bit more um, that I can do. Um, we, we all have a role in suicide prevention and all of these different um, identities that we carry with us on the day to day. Uh, and so, um, we really feel that this saves lives. We hear that it saves lives uh, and we know that it, we never know who um, if we just listen a little differently um, and pay attention um, in a different way than maybe we have in the past. Um, so this is my contact information. Um, and then again, our, at the CHA website, uh, we have some more additional information available. Um, so thank you. Jenny, thank you. That was really just some very, very helpful information. And I saw um, Susan had a question about getting the list. Do you see that in the chat? Oh, distribution list. Yes, <laughs> thank you. So, um, yeah, you can, we can, uh, if you send me your email or you just email me directly, but also on the Mental Health First Aid website. Uh, many instructors list their trainings that are available. And so, uh, some, if they're virtual, they don't necessarily have restrictions on who they can train. And so um, that's another way that you can look, search for instructors as well as uh, trainings that are happening. People have other questions, comments? Just a lot of great information. Can I say one thing? Honestly, I can't express 
as much as you have maybe taken it in the past, like myself, I need to be updated because of the fact that things have changed so rapidly and we've gone into three years of COVID mentality, isolation and everything else and dealing with the seniors especially, but I also deal with the youth. It's, it's just been so fluid that um, I'm sure that you've introduced much more on a yearly basis. So I guess that's why I want to um, go on a distribution list. I, I feel like I need to take it every year now. Thank you. Yeah, and actually, I, that you make a good point too, is that a person who gets the training is a three-year certification, and then it is encouraged to, to re-up. Um, and there are updates. Uh, you know, a few years ago, they added in a lot more about opioids um, and even like a Narcan dis, um, video um, at one point. And so so they make updates that sometimes take time to catch up with, with the um, what's happening uh, nationally, but that it really is based on feedback from the participants, from the instructors. What do people need? What are people looking for? Um, so thank you. All right, any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, one of the, in the hot off the presses, I literally just got an update while we've been meeting that the conference committee on the mental health bill is going to start their meetings tomorrow. There's apparently going to be a public meeting tomorrow. So to the extent that people are interested in that, um, and then they will begin hammering out the details of that mental health bill that I talked about at the beginning of the meeting. Um, I don't see, Lisa, I don't know if anybody wants to mention or address the 988 um, hotline that's being rolled out. So I just put in the chat the link oh, for today's it's only 15 minutes we'll be hearing from um lori krinsky and um it, it, it should be really really interesting so anybody who has 15 minutes and can uh, jump on we'll have a lot to learn It'd be great bob you have anything bob rita glue is here you're on mute Oh, here we go. Do you hear me now? Yeah. Thank you so much. That was very interesting. We don't think about this subject, but it's a very sad subject. Unless you've experienced it within family or friends, it really doesn't affect you, but it is very prevalent and it's a very, very sad. It's on the rise and you, you just can't imagine what people go through. So thank you very much for that. That's very interesting. Could I please have the last name of Jessica who spoke first? What was there? Because I do a report on everything that's said here for the sheriff's office, and I don't want to just refer to her as Jessica. Could I just have her last name, please? I'll, I'll drop it in the chat box. It's, it's Vanderstad, but yes, I'll drop it in the chat box with my email as well. Thank you so much. Thanks. I was going to do the same. Thanks. Thank you. Bob, you got anything? No, I'm good, Marion. I I, um, I was amazed at the statistic about the assisted living. That's amazing with the guns and assisted living. Uh, something, like you said, something, never think of that. Right. Uh, and so many, and I, I, I'm i involved with some of the sportsmen's clubs, and, you know, it's not a popular thing on, in this forum, but I'm I'm a gun owner and have been for, for decades. Um, but I'm involved with some of the sportsmen's clubs and some of these older members, I could see exactly that situation happening. They've got a collection of guns that they've collected over the years and, and they've been responsible gun owners. Um, but then again, they start to lose it a bit from, from age. And uh, yeah, you know what? That's, um, I could see that being a real tragedy. It, it has been a tragedy in so many places, and it is exactly what you said. People, you know, the question of whether people legally own guns or not is not up to us. Um, but they've been legally owning them very responsible. They move out of their house just like they take other things. They take the gun with them. That's perfectly legal. The facility, just like if you move into an apartment anywhere, is not asking you if you're bringing the gun. Lots of times the adult children, you know, they've lost track of that. There's the whole moving thing. They just lose track of it. Or mom or dad is fine when they move. Mm. It's just as the years pass and their condition deteriorates, 
And again, many to the two, we've had at least two where folks' condition had deteriorated. They'd moved into the memory care part of the facility, which obviously is one of the benefits of going to one of these places. And their possessions just got packed up and moved. No one went through the boxes. And there was the gun in the box. Right. So it's just, it is something really to be thinking about to, for people to think about who are gun owners while they are well, like when would I want somebody to come take the gun? And if you're moving somebody into a facility, what are the rules and what are they doing about that sort of thing? All right. So. All right, that's a great point. All right, well, we will, um, we are gonna try to coordinate our summer meetings just to maximize attendance and obviously work with our presenters about schedule. So Nora will send all of that, but thank you all again. Thank you to our presenters. Thank you for being here. Have a great 4th of July. Take care. Okay, okay. good timing. How are you, man? I got your 13 year, Madeira.